Hi guys, welcome back to another episode of Cinnamon Tonic. Today's story is that of Colonel Russell Williams. Pack your bags, we're off to Canada. Whee! That's a plane. Let's go. I am feeling spicy today. I'm I'm not in a good way. Mm -hmm. uh, honestly, I have had one of those days, you know when you are being tested, you are being tested. Your patience is being frazzled. Yeah. So I'm I'm glad to be here for a number of reasons to see you all, which is always lovely. But also I feel like this is the safest place for me to be. Tucked away in the shed away from people. Because quite frankly, I could be writing myself an episode of Sin and Tonic the way I feel. <sighs> there are some really lovely place names in this case. One of the cute name places is Tweed. How how lovely is that? Tweed, Ontario, Canada. Sounds nice. And it was. It was quaint, very friendly. You know, everyone sort of knew everybody. The sort of place where nobody locks their doors. Ooh, uh. In 2007, a string of bizarre break-ins would begin. These break-ins would continue all the way into 2009. And I find that kind of like, whoa, because it was quite a small place by the sounds of it. But yeah, mind you, these break-ins were over two different sort of areas. So we had Tweed, Q, and also Ottawa. Ottawa. The break-ins in Tweed and Ottawa over the years were linked together because of the very unusual MO of the burglar. This dude was not stealing silverware. No, no. He was stealing underwear. Women's underwear. Or girls' underwear. Grim. And actually, I'm not making light of it, because it was, it frightened the communities, because in some cases, it became apparent that he wasn't just stealing their underwear. He was spending time in their homes. He was breaking in and I, I can't I can't think of a nice way to put this, but he was a masturbating also because, yeah, there was evidence of that. Now, of all the, all of the sort of evidence to leave, really? Was that all part of the sort of... I want to say fun of it. Not, you know, I wouldn't find that fun. But this person obviously did. It was just um, grim. The grim thing as well is that some of the people involved were like children. So there was a 12-year-old girl, for example. Her bedroom specifically had been targeted. Her underwear, <clears throat> excuse me, her underwear had been taken. She was 12. There were pictures of her in her room as well. So it would have been obvious that this was an underage girl. Again, there was another incident with a 15-year-old girl. And again, very obvious that she was underage. And her underwear had been taken. Her room had a lovely mess left behind. So it's dodge, dodge. And also the impact that that had on those children was unpleasant and the women as well knowing that somebody has broken into your house and gone into your space let alone your room and gone through your personal items he didn't all only just take their underwear he also would take pictures from their bedrooms of them so that's creepy as most of the initial break-ins that happened in tweed i will never not like saying i think it's so cute but get this, they all, most of the initial ones were on Cozy Cove Lane. Cozy Cove Lane. Absolutely shut up. I need to live there. I think I'd be safe to now. It just sounds, what a lovely place name. If any of you, I, you know sometimes you're driving around places you don't know and you just see like a road and you're like, oh, I wish I'd, I'm going to start taking photos of them because some I can't think recall a single one. But sometimes you're somewhere and you're like, oh, my God, like what a cool name. Sometimes they're naughty. Sometimes they're naughty. Oh, there was one. I can't remember it. See, I need to take photos. But I love a good, like fun or sweet road name. I do. Cozy Cove Lane. Not very cozy, though, obviously, at this time. 
a lot of the people involved were scared, terrified to be at home. Women and families were locking their doors and being more cautious in, in these areas. But the people that had been broken into, it did really affect their lives. I mean, I think the story with the 15-year-old girl, she didn't sleep in her bedroom for months. You wouldn't. So it's just, it, it had a big impact on the victims. Mid-September 2009, things escalate. The burglar breaks into a woman's home. She's a new mum. She's got an eight-week-old baby sleeping nearby. He breaks in, hits her over the head with a torch, and then proceeds to sexually assault her with her baby just, like, there. The ordeal went on for a couple of hours. He broke in at about one in the morning and he left at about three. And during the process, he also took, like, photographs of her, sexual photographs. And this is just terrifying. This is like something out of a horror film because, as you would worry, like the previous victims of the break-ins, you'd be scared to be in your home, which is a really horrible feeling. Horrible feeling, I'm imagining, but I would hate that. He broke into the same house, that woman's house again, the next night. And the following week, there was a third break-in at her house yet again. So this is just like, that's taunting behaviour, isn't it? And and mm, like, just, yeah, that's really scary. The next time he broke into a home, he had already staked out the property and he had been there before. And this time he... He, he would also like make sure that the women lived alone or had sort of absent partners, boyfriends, you know, maybe they didn't live together. So they were likely on their own. He broke into a woman's house and she was asleep on the sofa and then he hit her on the head and subdued her. She was unconscious. And again, this attack would be an escalation from the previous one, can you believe? This time he beat the woman, he choked her, and then he sexually assaulted her, and, and again, he took photos. He spoke to this victim, and she she was asking questions like, it's just horrible, but like, you know, was he going to kill her? Things like that. And he spoke to her, and she recognised his voice. I don't know, that's even more creepy. And very brazen of him. I mean, it is brazen, isn't it? He leaves, first of all, he's breaking in all these times like he's already broken in I think it was about 80 times or more between 2007 and 2009 so he's already got you know nearly a hundred break-ins under his belt if you can you know if that's how you want to put it and he he's leaving his like DNA at the crime scenes sometimes he's his you know semen uh what and then he's talked to this woman. It's just very brazen. The two sexual assaults were linked, linked. The police were hot on the case and it wasn't long before they thought they had their guy. He lived on dun -dun, no other than Cozy Cove Lane. He was called Larry Jones. Poor guy. Because, spoiler alert, he was not the guy. The second victim, when she'd recognised the voice, she had said that it could possibly have been Larry Jones. So he was taken in for extensive questioning. He had his fingerprints taken, DNA, three-hour polygraph. I mean, all things that you would expect to happen if they have got a possible suspect. So I just feel sorry because I'm glad that they did it because you would hope that they would if they've got a suspect. And that's how it needed to be done. But because he was innocent, it was quite an ordeal to go through. And it took three weeks for him to be cleared. And during that time, like I say, this is a small place, Cozy Cove Lane, Tweed. And people, a lot of people were pretty sure that, you know, he was this guy doing these really horrible things and breaking in and sexual assault now at this point. So he was not you know, in favour in Tweed, but then the break-ins continued. So people, it, pe I think he, he just had, must have had to keep himself to himself because <clears throat> a lot of people thought that he was guilty. One break-in at around this time was at, just outside of Tweed. So you had Ottawa and you had Tweed and these two locations were targeted. But one of the places was more sort of like in the rural outskirts of Tweed on the way to Ottawa, I believe, I think. 
this woman was getting ready for her birthday party. She went upstairs and she realised that her drawers had been gone through and that her dildos were missing. She thought it was a prank, but it then became apparent that nobody in the house had done this. And then it was like, well, creepy as hell, because um, somebody has stolen those things as well from, from her house. So she said to her friend about calling the police and he said, no, because they'll just laugh at that. Like, that's just, it's just silly. It's just like f- silly. I would not have given that advice. I find it incredibly creepy, not silly. Anyway, she didn't call the police and off she goes to her birthday party. On the way out, they make sure that the house is completely locked up, like dead bolted the back door. Everything was secure and she wasn't going to stay there that night. So that was fine. Next day, she returns home. She goes in. She goes up to her home office to print something off or something, scan something. I don't know, something officey. And she screams. Her friend's downstairs. He runs upstairs. And on her computer that she never really uses, like an old computer, it's been turned on and the screensaver has been turned off so that the screen is just like on all the time. And there is a typed message on her screen. Can you believe this? This is like something out of a film, isn't it? Are films based on all this shit? Or do these people just go, like, base their stuff on the films? Question for you. The message read something like, go ahead, call the police. I want to show the judge your really big dildos. Mature. What the heck? And also, this means that the... This is what's chilling. That the intruder was in her house and was listening when her and her friend, before she went off to her party, had talked about calling the police. So then all of a sudden, this is just not silly anymore. Somebody has been in her home while she was there. And that, again, is just terrifying. She went to her bedroom to see if anything else had been taken. And lo and behold, her, her underwear drawers had been emptied and they had all of the contents had been stolen. Like I said, this house was slightly outside of Tweed and they were under a different police department. I think it was called Bellevue. Again, what a lovely name. Lovely. Bellevue Police Department. And they, at the time, had no idea about what was going on in Tweed with these uh, break-ins and all of this and all of the, you know, the underwear being stolen. But the woman did know about it. She'd heard, you know, the stories of what was going on. So she actually informed the Bellevue Police very sadly, things took a turn for the worst on the 25th of November 2009. Yet another escalation. Corporal Marie France Camo. Camo. Apologies if that's wrong. I think it's Camo. 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 It's French. 38 years old. She lived in Brighton, Ontario. And this was not very far from the military base there. She was a flight attendant on some of the flights that would be to and from the base. She was in the forces. She was a free spirit. She loved life. She was an artist. She loved her job because her job meant that she was stationed in different places around the world. And just the week before, she had flown on a flight. Like, you know, they would fly VIPs and presidents and stuff like that in these military planes. That was what where she, what she did and she basically the week before had traveled around the world she'd been she'd been everywhere she was loving it on the 25th of november her body was found in her home she had been suffocated i'm not sure if this case was immediately linked to these attacks that had been happening sadly not very long after this another attack would take place january the 28th of 2010 27-year-old Jessica Lloyd came home from a night out with her friends. Her house was one of the sort of more isolated houses on the outskirts of these places. So it was isolated, but it was also visible from the road that ran from Tweed to on Ottawa. Late that night, about 3am, two men were driving in a truck. They were going to Ottawa, I believe, to pick up a load like they were working. And As they drove past her house, they noticed an SUV parked in the field, sort of like to the side back 
of her house and they both commented on how bizarre that was because it wasn't parked in the drive or like next to the house or in front of the house it was in an odd place like it was almost parked like the person who had parked that SUV didn't want it to be visible from the house right bit creepy enough to make these two men be like oh that doesn't feel quite right the next day Jessica had not arrived at work and her mum called her brother who went round to her house and he found her purse her ID her money her cards her glasses just you know everything that you would expect a person to have with them was at the house but she was not A huge missing person case went underway at this point. There were posters made up. Her face was everywhere, local in all the local areas. You know, she's she's missing. And when the two men from you know the night when they drove past in their truck, when they saw her face and realised where they were talking about, they came forward to the police and they let them know about this SUV that they had seen in the field near her house. The police tootle over to the property and they go to the place where these two men have you know told them that the car SUV was what does SUV stand for I've just suddenly realized I I have no I don't know at all SUV couldn't guess vehicle something something vehicle super ultra vehicle (laughs) I've got Google oh sports utility vehicle a car similar to a minivan or a station wagon but with a much tougher look and a design suited for off-road driving. Okie dokes. We don't really I don't we don't really call them that, do we? We would we would say like four by four, I guess. I digress. The police go to the field, to this place, and they take the tire impressions because there are tire impressions in this field. It's been like cold as. So there's still the tire impressions there. And they take these tire impressions. And then what they do, I think, is clever. So they set up lots and lots of, like, uh, road traffic stops to check the tire tires of vehicles. So they stop people and they're just checking their tires, basically. How did they do that? Was it, like, with the... Com- In my head, it's very CSI. Like, they're not literally standing there with, like... They haven't rolled... I've got a print and they're like looking like that surely it's like the car drives over something a computer or a screen or something and then it goes boom 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 match like the fingerprint thing you know I don't know I, I hope so that's so cool anyway they did that so they set up all these stops I'm going to imagine that that's what what it was it's like you drive on go burp, match burp, like that but it wasn't as obvious as that because they they stopped people they took the tire impressions and then everyone went on their merry way even the dude whose car tires came up as a match came up as a match must have been a silent boom 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 like that maybe just a little light it's like (laughs) thank you sir see you have a nice day and then off he goes did i say that in canada have a nice day i think that's more american isn't it have a nice day i know Canadians are meant to be really friendly, but I don't want to say that in case, um, I mean, wait, because you're going to be like, yeah, this dude, but hold your horses. The dude rocks up, goes over the tyre thing. It's a match. See you. Bye, sir. Bye. Off he drives. And then they put him under surveillance because they're like, you know, they want him to take them to Jessica. (sighs) Anyhow. This dude is Colonel Russell Williams. And guess where Colonel Russell Williams lives? Cozy Cove, Frickin' Lane and Ottawa. The reason he has two addresses, he's not like super duper rich, is because he is a military man, Colonel, and he has he lives near the base in Ottawa and has a home there with his wife. Mm-hmm, that's why and he also has a b- bungalow I call it a bungalow but th- but uh when I watched a video they kept calling it a cottage so I don't know if that's just like you know we we would call it a bungalow like a house that's on one floor and then but they called it a cottage but it was 
it's bungalow to me. I'll change bungalow. Bungalow, bungalow, funny word. Anyway, so he owned a bungalow in Cozy Cove Lane, as well as a place near the military base oh, rhymes, in Ottawa. He was an exemplary, a what? He was an exemplary memory. What the fuck? Exemplary. He was an exemplary. Oh, exemplary. He was an, <laughs> he was an exemplary member of the military. But could he have a very dark little secret? I think so. Now, I said, oh, all well, the Canadians friendly. And you're thinking, oh, well, clearly not, because one of them has been naughty. And I know that some they're not all nice, aren't they? That's not possible. But this guy was not actually born in Canada. He was born to English parents in England. You're welcome. Sorry. 7th of March, 1963. His family moved over to Canada when he was young. When he was six, his parents divorced and they both went off with different partners. And other than that, there's nothing to write home about in his childhood. Mm. He did spend quite a lot of time in boarding school, so I guess that could that you know it's a bit unusual, but nothing you know. There's no skinning of animals. It's all very straightforward. In college, he had a close circle of friends, and I think he was a bit of a a bit annoying. He they called him I think some sort of military thing like the the colonel or the major or something in college because he like designated tasks out for the for his roommates like you're going to do this you're going to do that and he wanted all of the you know he wanted to run like clockwork he was very um controlling and organized he only ever had one girlfriend in the whole time that one of his best friends had known him like for a number of like years and years and in that time he only ever had this one girlfriend and then she split up with him and it broke him massively. After that, despite having studied economics and political something at college for about four years, he decided that he was going to join the Air Force and that he wanted to be a pilot. A friend noted that it seemed to be quite inspired by the movie Top Gun and that at this time, so when his girlfriend's just sort of like left him, he started very much to live in a fantasy world. However, the guy did actually go on to become a pilot. So it wasn't like he was, you know, some people like hide, hide themselves and the reality that they're living in, in in a fantasy. And he had this sort of fantasy of becoming a pilot in Top Gun. He then actually went and freaking did it. So it wasn't like these people that, you know, they, they live in here and it's not real. He went out and he got it and he did. He became a pilot. Wasn't very Top Gun-like, though. Joined the Canadian Forces in 1987, and uh, what do you say? How do you say it? Got his wings or gained his wings in 1990. And he flew, and you're going to be like, oh, what, what, what? Mm -hmm. He flew the planes, the VIP planes, right? So he flew those with. I think he met the Queen, things like that, and just dignitaries. Is that the word? I, f I feel like I made that up as it came out of my mouth. Did you see it happen? Dignitaries, the word? He would fly these VIPs around, just like a glorified taxi driver, really, but with, like, really special people. Yeah, that's not fair, Sophie. That's quite an impressive thing. I couldn't fly a plane. But anyhow, he was promoted to captain in 1991, and at that time he met he married his wife there's not much about that she, it, 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 all very sort of quiet on the wife front so she was Mary Elizabeth and he, he married her in 1991 even a friend was quite surprised at their marriage his best friend didn't really even know about this like Mary like she just sort of popped up out of nowhere like us he was quite private insular and had a small circle he was promoted to major in 1999 promoted to lieutenant general in 2004 so he is he's going up and up and up and in 2009 he was promoted to wing commander i think must that give him the title of colonel then i guess I, i'm guessing i don't understand it there's so many things isn't there it's like oh it's a bit silly i think a bit much isn't it he was described as a shining bright star of the military. He he was having a very 
a brilliant career, very good career, and he was enjoying it. He was he was the right person for all of the jobs. Like basically, he he was calm to a not to a fault, I guess, because you really need that as an attribute but he was described as being almost like unusually calm for somebody that had an incredibly stressful intense job because at this point he's not just flying like VIPs around he has to do a lot of social engagements there's a lot to his role now a lot of uh, work like being in front of the public so a lot more to what he's doing now at this point the promotion in 2009 it really added quite a huge amount of pressure to his role. So it it massively increased what he was doing. And interestingly, when we look back at this point, this is when the crimes that were being committed massively escalated. He also started to spend more and more time alone in his bungalow cottage on Cozy Cove Lane. Just to note, he had a very sort of like, it was almost like he had a long distance relationship with his wife. It all seems a little fishy to me. She maintained and lived in Ottawa, I think the whole time. She had a job. I think she worked for like the Stroke or Heart Foundation. Um, and that's that was her life. And then he was in the military and he, you know, over the years was posted in different places, but but then ended up in Ottawa. But he would he was either working or he was spending a lot of time away from his wife so it's almost like they were estranged but I couldn't find any information about that I think they just lived very separate lives and she must have maybe appreciated that he had a very stressful job and that he needed time on his own to unwind I don't know you know yeah go for a beer with a mate go fishing on a Saturday morning but like having a separate house that you just like squirrel away to I mean no actually that does sound quite nice (laughs) on the 7th of February 2010 Ottawa Police Department go to William's home in Ottawa and he is taken for questioning and it doesn't seem like he's particularly phased the way that they have approached it is They haven't arrested him. They haven't even said he's a suspect. They have just asked him to come in to help with their inquiries. And they've made it sound like they're asking all the men in that area to come and do the same. So, you know, it wasn't too suspicious. At this point, he had no idea that they had matched his tyres. So he, he, I mean, I guess he just thought, yeah, cool, I'll come in. And I mean, he didn't ask for a freaking lawyer. He must have really felt like they had nothing and they were just asking him for, what, what, what do I mean? What, what is the word? Cooperation, maybe had he seen something, you know, that sort of thing. You can watch the interview and there is a guy called, uh, what's he called? Called JCS and I watched the interview and he like breaks it down and looks at body language and stuff I love I love his channel check him out if you haven't you probably have but if you haven't check him out and yeah they're really informative and it talks you through the interview I just I love it anyway I watched the interview on his channel because I like hearing what he has to say about it as well and after a while it's really clever as well but after a while he just breaks and it's not in a sort of you know like sometimes when you see people break they it's an emotional or like utter panic and dread and this guy was chill and it's it's just so matter of fact like as he then sort of it's almost like oh well you got me now okay and then he just like talks about it it's 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 bizarre to me and I found it chilling because I was like oh and like when he asks the interviewer asks you know, what's he the detective you know he says um what you know why he he should oh, i don't know oh, well he ends up showing the detective on a map where jessica's body is and talks about what has happened and what he's done he then confesses to the murder of Marie and it must have been I know I say it all the time but it really is you know out of a horror film and it's the things that you would just 
you you would be so scared to happen. He broke in and it wasn't the first time that he'd broken into her house. He'd done it before, but this time he knew that she was home and he broke in and went into her basement and just, he was waiting for her to go to bed. And I'm imagining that he was going to hit her and sexually assault her like he had done with these other two women. But sadly, when it came for her to start getting ready to to go to bed, she realised that her cat wasn't there and her cat had gone into the basement and her cat was staring at Williams. He was just staring at him. He wouldn't move. I mean, uh, like, you know, it's like having a guard dog, isn't it? This cat's just like, uh, you're not normally here. What the hell? So she she comes across him, basically. She comes down into the basement to get her cat and there she finds creepy freaking dude in her basement. But they know each other. They have worked together on a flight. So, and I think this is why what happened happened. So he hits her on the head with a torch and that moment of finding someone in your freaking basement must just be like, boom, terrifying. He bops her on the head. She's unconscious. He then, is that a spider? Please don't. I can't see anything. You're all like, oh my God. So... He carries her upstairs. On the way, he sort of like undresses her. He takes photos of her body while she's unconscious on the stairs and things like that. Takes her up to her bedroom and he rapes her. He films this. He films that. He takes more photos. On the video, she begs for her life. He's tied her up and he's put duct tape over her eyes and her mouth. And then he puts duct tape over her, around her nose. And then he watches her suffocate to death. After killing her, he places her body on the bed. He covers it with the duvet or with the cover. And then he steals more of her underwear. He had previously stolen some underwear on a break-in that he'd, you know, done before. And she had blamed her boyfriend. And it was all a bit sort of like, "Ah," and her boyfriend said, no, I didn't. But she really thought that it was just like her boyfriend messing about and taking some of her underwear and it wasn't he'd already taken some but after he kills her he takes more he then says in the interview that he had to kill her because she had seen him and and that might be true she'd come across him in the cellar in the basement and she had seen who he was so even though after that he would taped her eyes and stuff he knew that you know she knew so he, he I, I'm, I'm guessing he just didn't have a choice but what a sick way to to kill somebody to like watch them suffocate to death like really mate that's sadistic isn't it I think it would have only been a matter of time until he did kill but it forced his hand and it forced his killing to start the day after his arrest Williams would take the police to Jessica's body he said that he had been stalking her He had noticed her house because it was on the drive from Tweed to Ottawa. So we know that he had houses in both places. And he noticed that it was an isolated house on that road. And he had, you know, watched to see, like, did she have a boyfriend? Was she living alone? Creepy to think that this guy's just, like, it's made me feel weird. I feel weird now. On the 27th of January, he waited for her to go to bed. So this was his MO. He was waiting for these women to go to bed and then attacking them. She went to bed and he hit her over the head in bed. Again, he duct taped her eyes and her mouth and he filmed himself raping her again and took more photographs. And this is where he changes what what he he does. And I, I don't know why. He then takes Jessica in his truck, puts her in his truck and he drives her back to his home in Tweed. On place Cove Lane. At 5am, he forced her to have a shower and then he sort of said that she should get some sleep. I I doubt she did. Would you sleep? I mean, she might have been utterly exhausted, but anyway, he told her that she should sleep. And at this point, she then had a seizure. It's just awful. So she had this seizure and he panicked, kind of like made him angry, I think. After that, he raped her again. He then fed her some fruit and stuff for breakfast. He made her get dressed. He took off her tape and he pretended to let her go. And then he hit her over the head, rendering her unconscious. He then strangled her to death. 
After she was dead, he then took more photos. On the 29th of January, he buried her in a shallow grave. The location of this grave is, again, chilling. Do you remember Larry? Larry Jones. He was thought to be the, the, the guy, the guy that was, you know, breaking in and sexually assaulting these women. And obviously, Williams knew that. It was, you know, the whole town thought that Larry was guilty. So one day in passing, in between, you know, his suspicion for these assaults and now Jessica's murder, he has a conversation with Larry and he says to Larry, oh, look, what are you what, what are you up to? And Larry's going off hunting. And Williams shows a specific interest in where Larry likes to go hunting. Like, where's your usual place? Where do you usually go? And Larry describes it to him because he just thinks, oh, he's interested in what I'm doing and what I get up to, like, you know, neighbourly, friendly. Mm. Jessica's body was found in Larry's favourite hunting spot. So Larry was certain that basically Williams was trying to frame him. It was a setup. He was, he was, you know, if her, if and when her body was found, because it was in a shallow grave. And I think in the interview he mentions that you would see it if you walked past it. So I think he was just trying to, he was trying to divert any suspicion on, onto Larry. Thank God those two men driving at 3 a.m. saw his SUV in the garden. Because I don't doubt, I think that, that that he was triggered and he had just started his his killing and it would have continued. He would have killed more people. He wouldn't have been caught for Jessica's murder and it would have carried on. And he was escalating quite quickly at that point. So he would have killed more women, I'm sure of it. And he probably would have got caught at some point. Because I think, you know, his area was quite... He was he was staying in those areas, wasn't he? So I do think he would have done. But, yeah, thank God that... But again, though, what, what if they'd have found Jessica's body and they really had, you know, gone like, it's Larry, it's got to be Larry. You know what? Things like that happen. And when they've got their person, they don't want to admit that it's not that person. He could have been out there killing women for a long time if those men had not seen his his SUV. Yeah, thank God for them. His houses were searched. And in the, this blows my tiny mind, in Ottawa, so in the house that he, he shares with his wife, not Cozy Cove Lane, they did find things in Cozy Cove Lane. I think behind a piano, he had taped, like, who does he think he is? He had taped recordings you know, like recordings of rape, rape and just grimness to the back of his piano. They were like taped behind the piano. Lucky that didn't need to be repaired, mate. And there, mm. oh, oh, sorry, just take those. Oops, forgot they were there. And then, but in Ottawa, where his wife lived, he, there were boxes and boxes of women's underwear and photographs, kid you not, I'll share some photographs of this dude in the in women's underwear so he was some of the pictures in their houses as well so in the victims houses he's in in their underwear and he's snapped photos of himself I've just had a terrible thought shit because in the pictures it's like has he got how is he because he's taking the photos himself right surely if he's alone what if his wife was in on it what if she goes too and it's all a bit of a kinky thing and he basically she takes the photos of him in their underwear maybe she didn't know about the sexual assaults and stuff but maybe it was like this kinky like let's break in stranger things have happened haven't they but anyway that is purely speculation on my part my brain just went there but okay forget that because that's like there is no mention of that at all anywhere that was just my sick brain but there are all these photos sometimes in the victim's houses of him in their freaking underwear so he puts it on and masturbates while doing so and then takes photos of himself and then steals the underwear probably wears it out probably puts his clothes back on and then 
there are also diaries, like a catalogue of what he's taken and where he's taken it from and when. Mate, why do they do that? Like, why do, it's like it's a hobby. It's like there's something so not right in there, isn't there, for that to be like, oh, you know, I'm just going to drop down Pink Brazil, 34 Pesico Lane. Do you know what I mean? For goodness sake. But that is obviously helpful for the police. My other thought here is, what an effort, all of this effort. This is a guy with a very demanding job. And it's like, do you know what? I guess it's a bit like, you know, something isn't an effort if it's, if you enjoy it. Oh, 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 just even saying that is just so gross. Because I know lots of people that are like, like I'm doing a degree, me, as in myself, and I work and I've got kids and husband, house, and it's all a bit crazy at the moment. And I do get quite overwhelmed. And people are like, oh, maybe like, you know, you shouldn't, maybe you could give um, Sin and Tonic a break and maybe not film for a bit or, you know, like take something off your plate. But this is the thing I like. This isn't the chore. <laughs> Hello? Hello. But, you know, when, it, when it's the thing that you enjoy and the thing that is bringing you joy and happiness, it's not a chore. It's not difficult. None of it is like, oh, I've got to do that. Writing an essay, you know, for him, he was probably like, oh, my God, I've got to be here doing this bloody job. Oh, I can't wait till I can... I'm not even going to say it. But do you know what I mean? On the 18th of October 2010, Williams pleaded guilty to the murders and break-ins, etc. The trial was quite graphic, literally, because there were video recordings, photographs, so probably quite traumatic to see and be a part of. He was sentenced to two life terms and a further 120... I love it when they do that, but I know it's uh, to give justice to everything that he's done, but... So two life terms and then 120 years for all the other crimes that he'd committed. He was quite quickly placed on suicide watch. I, I, keep, I read, kept seeing like he's in solitary confinement. I don't know if he still is, but he was on suicide watch for trying to shove, like suffocate himself by shoving a toilet roll tube down his throat. And his mental health just, it deteriorated quickly once he had been arrested. He had a very big fall from grace, this guy. On the day of Marie's body being found, Corporal Marie, he found out later that day and he wrote a letter of condolence to her parents. He is sick, isn't he? The military are disgraced. They are disgraced by him. They said it was the ultimate betrayal of the honour that had been given to him. And his wife has never publicly spoken about any of it. And there, there is a lot of doubt that she did not know anything. There was stuff in her house. And um, I, I, I don't know. He did write to his wife when he was in prison, like, love you, take care of the cat. Nice one. But why? I don't get the why. I don't. I do, I think, fall on the, I err more on the nurture side of everything, you know, like of that debate. I feel like there's so many times that the people that commit heinous, horrible crimes, things like this, they've often got so many things in common and trauma, childhood trauma, abuse, having alcoholic parents, having troubled upbringings, things like that often are at play. So cases like this fascinate me because I'm almost like desperately searching for it. I'm like, okay, what happened to this guy when he was a kid? Because there's got to be something. But maybe sometimes, and maybe that's what it is. It's a spectrum. So you've got You've got like, you know, is it nature, is it nurture? And I guess people fall in that spectrum. Some people with, because not everyone that has a horrible childhood murders people or, or rapes people, like they just don't. So, you know, some, there, there's got to be a mixture of nature and nurture. You've got to be susceptible to it, I think. Like, you know, have the propensity to commit a, a crime. But also, you know, some people must have more of an influence for it to happen and trigger it. And some people just hardly need any. 
because it's just like okay it's in there that's how they were made and don't take very much and then ba boom it comes out so it's more like nature but geez I mean he was quite old when this all started he wasn't like a young man so crumbs yeah it's like there were no red flags that's difficult. That's scary, isn't it? No red flags. You need that in life to keep yourself safe. And and that is why this case is so terrifying because they're like, you know, you know, people didn't stand a chance. Women, women didn't stand a chance. But he went from fetish burglar to sadistic killer. You know, that just ha- it just who it happened. Was it the pressure of his job? You know, was that just enough of a trigger for him to be like, way, here we go. That's what I'm going to do now. Boom. I'm fully in. Okay. And that is all I have for you on today's case. Thank you so much for joining me. Hope you can join me next week for another gram story. And a glass, vase, bottle, hug, buggle, muggle of gin. Not much to report, but thank you so much because I came up to the shed wanting to gouge my own eyes out with rage and now I feel much better I do so thanks that's worked a treat I wasn't sure how it was going to go how just another week of essay writing and research for me so quite boring um I think my life might be a bit like that really until May that's exciting isn't it but you know and like I said this is the stuff that keeps me going coming up here doing something creative Uh, researching, coming up with how I'm going to tell the story, putting it all together. It's, I enjoy all of it. So it's not, it's not a chore. Yeah, I love it. And I love you. You are special. Oh, tell me what you've been up to. Anything fun? Uh, We have got this week coming up. Christmas is beginning. Okay, guys, because we have got what? (coughs) I have got Christmas dinner with my village mums at the local pub yes and oh that'll be now that'll be now I will release this it will be all set up to release when I am literally tucking my chair in that's what I'm doing now guys oh that's a nice thought I'm literally right now as you watch this pulling up my seat under the table and uh, waiting for my Christmas dinner with my girls cheers that's all cheers be like that and that's friday and then on sunday panto day panto day going for a spot of lunch and then watching um peter pan panto not seen a peter pan panto have i no i don't think i have so i'm looking forward to that because i like peter pan and obviously yeah it's for the kids obviously but yeah i'm looking forward to that so christmas has begun christmas has begun i know the decks are all up but when you start doing all the christmasy jazz it's when it's like all kicking off. I'm going to love you and leave you because my tummy's growling. I need my dinner and I need a cup of tea. Weird. I need a cup of tea and my dinner. Cup of tea first. Cup of tea after. Cup of tea before and after. Yes. Made the choice. Thank you. Okay. I love you and I will see you all next week. Have a wonderful weekend. Bye.